<laughs> so that's uh, that was. Tell them about hard. your idea about the shock treatment. Remember that? Yeah, we had. Uh, <laughs> have, they, have many people here read the book by any chance? Yeah. yeah. Well, it's a, little, it's a little hard to fathom. Or something, yeah. isn't it? I was working on it, and I was about halfway through when I got an idea, a terrible idea, and a brilliant idea, and a terrible one, and I went in and I saw Bob, and I said, Bob, you know, this is not a ghost story at all. I said, it doesn't make any difference, we're telling one hell of a scary picture, but it's not a ghost story, it's about, about a woman who's having a nervous breakdown. And uh, it's a psychological drama, and of course there is a certain amount of that, and he said, what do you mean? And I said, well, it won't make any difference, it'll be good, and I think we can use a lot of the stuff that I've already done, but we better know what we're doing, and know that we're not doing a ghost story, we're doing a psychological drama. And I proved it to him, in, 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 or, or attempted to, I said, uh, the cold spot and the sense of cold, that shock treatment, which is a well-known thing. That's a, and I could go right through the whole thing, or the, uh, the various people, the Dr. Markware, the doctors, doors opening and closing, that's how people would be in an, in an, in an institution, and, and uh, it, it, it was pretty easy to prove. So Bob said, well, I guess we better get this cleared up. So we went off to uh, Bennington, Vermont where Shirley Jack Jackson lived with her husband, Professor Hyman, who was a professor there. And uh, we went to see her, and we went to lunch. And we told her our fear and our idea, and she said, no, that isn't true, but it's a hell of an idea. <laughs> <laughs> She's the one that gave us the title. It was the original title of the Hollings Hill House, and we did, there had been other hill, uh, Hollings around, and we didn't think that was the right title. Was, remember we said to her, did you ever uh, have any other idea? Uh, for the uh, for the title of the book, she said, "No, I always had uh, the, the idea of calling the Haunting of the Hill House. The only other title I ever considered was the Haunting, which was just right there." And she gave it to us. But she was a lovely, lovely lady and, and great, uh, great fun. But um, she thought Nelson's idea of of, of, the, of this being shock treatment and all was a hell of a good idea. I don't think she ever got around to writing it, did she? <laughs> Were any of the characters in the screenplay different from the book? Well, yes, they, they, they are. They're somewhat different. For one thing, they're so beautifully uh, portrayed by all the actors, they do take on a much better and uh, a more defined life and, 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 and characteristics. The, 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 the character in the book is, is um, not very important. Luke Sanders is important, but he's not very interesting. And it's uh, Russ who has made it, uh, well, he's, it's the humor. And, I, I believe a great deal in writing put humor in everything. And those of you who see I Want to Live will see there's a certain amount of humor in that, and that's what Bob likes. I don't say it's a funny picture, <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> but n n neither, is, neither is the haunting. And uh, people like, oh, not people, Russ, did, did, well, you see, he, he did a wonderful job on it, and, and he was given, of course, brilliant lines, but... <laughs> <laughs> but he did. He 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 made he made that character. The character is nothing like that in the book. He's he, he's rather flat, as a matter of fact. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, I must confess, uh, uh, and you know, it's at 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 this point, it's hard to do. But uh, confess. Well, the way that what happened with me is, I was in Paris. I actually turned this part down. To begin with, uh, I was in Paris, and Bob sent me a script, and I read it, and it was fairly flat. All these, the other characters were totally interesting, and uh, Luke Sanderson had some one-liners, and uh, which I thought, you know, I was terribly interested in the psychic phenomena and, and, and all of that, the serious part of it, but it, I didn't see any humor, uh, you know, outside of that, how, how I fit in it. It just didn't, uh, so I, I remember that uh, I passed on it, in fact, flew back to the States and was under contract at MGM and uh, they called me up and they said, Bob would really like you to do this script and you are under contract to us <laughs> and perhaps you would want to read it again. So <laughs> Little I read it again twisting. and suddenly it just looked like a much, much better part. <laughs> and you know, in, in retrospect, I mean, the reason that it's confession or embarrassing because now that I, that I look at it I think that uh, you know it's one of the one of the favorite movies that I've done uh, two probably West Side Story and The Haunting uh, both being Bob's movies so that's how that's how I got involved in it. and then of course once I accepted it and, and got there and saw what we were what we were dealing with uh, I think 
Bob, you ought to tell him about the, uh, th this house that we worked in was a real haunted house. I mean, Bob wouldn't just, you know, get away with just uh, uh, sets. He had to go to the, to the uh, Ghost Society in London and not only find a uh, haunted house, but the most haunted house in England, which was way up in the, you know, in no, the near us. Uh, it was outside of uh, Stratford. Stratford-on-Avon, right. Yeah. And um, it, was, it was an old manor house. And it did have a history of a, of a ghost. And the, when the family had owned it 100 years before, there was a young lady in the house that had fallen in love with a young man in the neighborhood who was not up to the family standards. And they cut her off. And so we had a case of unrequited love. And she was supposed to have jumped out of that tower window and killed herself. It was at the time we found it. It was, uh, it was uh, I didn't use it. It was a, it was a, it was a hotel. Yeah, yeah, so he not only did we work there, but we he lived there. Stay there. <laughs> there was a funny story. We went down a, 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 a couple of days ahead of time. The, the camera crew and I went down to shoot some of those exteriors, the shots of the windows and stuff like that, to get all the atmosphere we could. As a matter of fact, the little inside, we, we shot a lot of those shots with infrared films, black and white infrared, to get those black skies and bring out the, the striation of the white in the, in, the, in the snow. And so it gave it a, a little more potent look. And. Uh, but it was it was a it was a very fairly eerie place, and we were down there shooting, as they say, a day or two ahead. And on Saturday morning, I, uh, Claire and uh, Julie Harris were due to arrive, and I saw this big Princess Limousine coming up the drive, and I knew that was the two girls in the car. And I went over to the car to greet them, and I opened up the back door, and they're clutching each other, looking at the building. So you mean we had to stay there? <laughs> <laughs> But it served its purposes very well. And of course, that was all the exterior. The interiors were all done back at the Wormwood Studios, done by a marvelous production designer, Elliot Scott, who, who did a just fantastic job on that interior. And the cinematographer, interestingly enough, was a man who had previously been head of the stills department at MGM and had only done uh, s cinema photography on a couple of rather documentary type films. Had never done anything quite like this. But Scotty, the production designer, uh, uh, told me that uh, uh, Dave Bolton, the, the man he was talking about, was, was such a keen student of, of film and movies and loved, loved them so much. And he thought he would be an excellent uh, cinematographer. And he, I think, did a brilliant job really job on the show. Oh, the, the stuff on the on the stairway. I mean, they had to put the camera on the railing so yeah, it went you could go, go all the way uh, up and, and you know, that shot going all the way up. Everybody was, was asking how that was ever done, but that railing was simply like a, a track of a dolly. And so we started the, had a little wire control underneath. And we started the, the little handheld camera at the top, shooting up, and let it come down and just reversed it. So we went back up. And it was very strong, by the way. It looked uh, so weak like that, but it actually had one solid piece that went up through it that was like a very thick chain, or uh, uh, probably like a very thick chain that was loose, so you could shake it, but it was, you know, it looked like it was weak, but it was actually very, very strong. Let me open it up for a couple of questions. Well, yes. How did you do the narration of Julie Did you do that before the album back in the ARC? No, we, we, uh, we uh, we did the tracks originally. Uh, how were those? How were the voiceover tracks of Judy Harris done? Were they done uh, originally the same or ADR later? We we did a version of them originally uh, to have on playback to use on the set, and then we we did refine some of them uh, later on. But another place uh, uh, with us, all the sound effects were all pre-recorded and put on playback. And uh, usually you know, on a set, if you have some kind of noise off stage for somebody to react to, an actor to react to, uh, you know, some, uh, uh, a prop man rattles something, or break I realized the importance of these effects, that they really had to work on the actors, work on the people. So I had them all, all uh, scored. I uh, had a special sound man come on and made those, that, like you do a music track and put on playback. And then we did go on afterwards and refine a few of those. But they were all those things you saw with them reacting to the sounds outside the door and all were all done to a playback. Yeah, and I must tell you something about the, the, the house there itself. Uh, like Bob just said, at the interior, uh, all the stuff that you saw, that was all a set design. But in the actual house that you saw, they did have one section of the house that was a, uh, a library. And, and it was a big library that they had turned into, he had turned it into a little like coffee shop, a little bar, and, and uh, it was an inn, and people would come there and have a drink, and there were several tables around. And do you remember that night, Bob, that the, after everyone had left, and he said, oh, well, I must show you something very interesting in this house, and he actually, 
he actually pulled the bookcase out and there was a tunnel <laughs> that went <laughs> under the house and they had these underground caves <laughs> that went that went down uh, down down in under the grounds i don't know how far back oh, yeah. they went but it was it was scary <laughs> the best the best character in the movie is the house and i think that's the best job i think that bob's treatment of that the cinematography was fine, but the, the black heart and the cold soul of the house is Bob's. And he can tell you. <laughs> Don't you recognize that? That's me all over. Come on, you, you can see that just looking at me. And, and, and well, the writing wasn't bad, Nelson. I mean, come on. <laughs> and, yes, right here. How did Shirley Jackson feel about the finished film? How did Shirley Jackson feel about the finished film? I don't know. That she, I gather she didn't like it too much because I, 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 she saw it back in Albany or whatever, and I never heard from her. <laughs> uh, I have a question, uh, uh, Nelson. I mean, now that, that it's written, I know that there was one scene in the a film that we cut out th that I remember that was in it and it was cut out, I think, because they thought it might have been too set up too much. I'm not sure exactly why it was. But there was a film with, uh, uh, with Claire Bloom's character when she leaves in the beginning of the house and she, I guess she's living with a girl, and there was a scene you remember? Yeah, we had, a, we had it set up a little too strongly for the kind of lesbian inclination there. And there was a scene at the beginning that we shot that uh, she is yelling out the window at a, uh, a, a girl in a, in a convertible car down below, and something, uh, I forgot what was said, and then she went over on the mirror and wrote, I, that lipstick, I hate you, or something. We got a very strong impression of the relationship there, and it seems to sort of hit it too hard. Uh, for what uh, later developed is something that well, nowadays you wouldn't think that. twice about it. <laughs> it, it wasn't the, the, that scene wasn't in the book nor was the relationship very strong in the book we, we we strengthened it to a certain extent and what's very interesting to look at it today is how we made a complete turn we had to be so careful uh, in, in, in what we did and now it's a little embarrassing that we didn't come right out and do it <laughs> <laughs> yes We wanted to keep it inside. That was a whole theory in, in, in writing it. And Bob and I always have long discussions with see nothing. Let the mind see it all. If you look at this picture, which is really quite frightening, you see nothing. You only see actuality. And you, you can't see a cold spot. And we didn't want to take it outside. That would, that would be too simple. And that was obviously uh, uh, supernatural, these people. There weren't people so we. We didn't use anything like that. We just used your, you, the audience's yeah. imagin imagination and ours. Yes. Uh, yeah, there's a, a book that I read after I, I saw this movie as a kid by Shirley Jackson called We've Always Lived in the Castle. And I believe it was turned into a play and it also deals with the supernatural and the psychological in a very similar way. I'm just wondering if you'd have ever, you'd ever thought about it. Yeah, I, I think I took a look at that somehow. I didn't, it didn't catch me up like this one did. Uh, uh, it was interesting. He's always a fascinating writer, but I didn't see the potential in it as a movie that uh, I felt of this one. Bob has a phrase that will explain it to you. Never be the first to be second. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, no, it was always, always, uh, always playing in black and white. Um, I wouldn't. I would never have thought of doing it in color. I, I just think there's a certain texture and tone and feeling, and atmosphere you get in black and white for this kind of story. That no matter how desaturated you make the color or treat it, I don't think it has the same effect as black and white. And that's. Um, it was also at a time that black and white was accepted. Still. Yeah, sure. So but Bob, is there? Uh, that, that's my last black and white film. I haven't been able to make been able to make one since. I would have done the Hindenburg in black and white if I'd had the opportunity to do it. Bob, is there any question now about colorization? Uh, yes, I have a story about that. <laughs> there was a uh, congressional little committee, st a group uh, investigating, uh, looking into this whole thing about what was happening with films several years ago when colorization started to come in to be a hot, a hot item and one of the congressmen came out and had some hearings out here about the whole matter of what was happening in films, what they wanted on television, among other things was colorization. 
and uh, he had a daytime session with a lot of people around town. I, was, I didn't attend that, but then he asked just out of curiosity, he said he'd like to see how the whole process of coloriza colorization was done, how it was just out to, for his own information. And so they arranged for him to go down to the colorization uh, company the next morning, and the, my guild asked me if I would go down and sit in, and we had somebody from the Cinematographers Guild and production designers, and quite a few four or five of us down there. So they took us in, the, the congressman and his two or three staff people and the rest of us that gave us a little talk about how it was done. Then they started taking us around the plant. And you go into one of the rooms and uh, they're all rather dark and they've got the lights and the computers going on the screen. It's all done through, through computers. And I forgot what picture was on there and they talked a little bit about it. And then they took us out of that into another room and there was the haunting. <laughs> up on this and they said, look at that, you know, you have, a, you have a purple room in your, look at that purple room we've given you. <laughs> and I blew my top. And, <laughs> and uh, so I went back and checked my contract and talked to my guild and I had spelled out in my contract specifically that it was to be done in black and white, which was very unusual in those days, for that to be spelled out. So we kind of threatened Turner and then there was a whole question about who had the rights to the original authors and whatnot, Shirley Jackson also. It's been pulled back, pulled off of colorization or even making any more tapes for a while. But um, I hope you all speak out against that kind of uh, treatment of our film. Take the last question now. Yes. None at all, none at all. No, I, I, so we, we had a big search for the house, and we had a, people going out, and, and uh, actually Scotty, our production uh, designer, went out before way before early on, and we, uh, we um, uh, got pictures from places all over, the, all over, all over England, and finally decided this was the best one after we went down to see it. And uh, there's no, no conscious effort. I was looking for something that look, could look like a house that had. <laughs> all the ingredients that we needed. I love those windows that it had and the way we were able to light and the striated marble and, and stone in it to, just seemed to appeal to everything. And of course the sets inside were all, were all the Baroque kind of things that uh, Scotty did. I had an interesting, just talking about the photography and look of the film, I had an interesting uh, discussion uh, early on when I was getting ready to do it. Um, this was Panavision, uh, cinema, uh, Panavision uh, anamorphic. And, um, I, I wanted some rather extreme shots, and at that time, this is 30 years ago, I think about the widest angle we had was about a 35 in, in, uh, in Panavision. And I wanted something as extreme as I could get for some of those shots up the stairwell and down that hallway and all, to, to, just to make it as extreme as I could, to get as wide an angle. I, I called Bob Gottschalk, who was one of the, one of the, one of the inventors of Panavision and, and back in those days, and I said, Bob, um, don't you have anything wider than a, than a 35? You know, I, I'd, I'd usually like to get something as extreme as possible here for some effects. And he said, well, we are working on it, developing a 28, but it's got distortion in it. I said, Jesus, that's just what I want. <laughs> and, and he and he, he got a hell of a time getting it out of me. Finally, he relu almost reluctantly he sent it to me, but I had to sign a whole document and have an affidavit that I would not hold him responsible for any distortion <laughs> in that. <laughs> I'd like to thank Russ Tamblin. Nelson Gidding and Robert Wise. And thank you for coming. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.